And that's probably where a lot of their animation budget went. The Council of Awesomeness is now in session. I love this scene. If you looked at the very end of that cutscene, it's implied that Leth and Mordecai are here, which they must have travelled pretty far from our army to get over here. So we're finally meeting Kurthanaga's father. We saw this guy before during chapter 13. So yeah, this is the king of Phoenicis. The king of the hawks. Yeah, he was watching us during that battle. Ah, uh, Dayan were kind of the people attacking her, so yes they do. Yeah, Nasala knows full well that they were working with Dayan, those people. First, this is being made public. That might affect his reputation. Two long months, or two fairly short chapters. They have um, methods of gaining information.
both of you will desist at once. King Nesala of Kilbas, your actions of late can be judged as too extreme. Okay, I won't do that anymore. Uh, anyone who's played the other, uh, who's played Radiant Tom will know what I'm joking about there. Ah, uh, yes, that. Good thing that happened close to Dragon Territory. And so Nasala rants about his general motivations. Kilvaz is also, well, it's suffering from both poverty and something else. So he does have his reasons for wanting money for Kilvaz, but the fact that he pretty much backstabs everyone he deals with, uh, can be a little hard to sympathize with. Yeah, so it seems like while the Ravens just want money, Tivan and the Hawks have very personal reasons for preying on Benyon vessels. Specifically that. Yeah, we're getting a lot of new information and new um, reveals here. So here's Rayson. We heard it from the chapter before that herons are very valuable and almost all of them are wiped out. But Rayson is not exactly the picture of a um, peaceful, serene heron. This is actually a really good line, right here. Why? And this is actually kind of weird. I've always liked this line, but I forgot that it was Degincia who said it, and the fact that it is actually hurts the impact of the line quite a lot. Seems like they intended all along to go for Gallia. Crimea was just a stepping stone. Yeah, Tivon is pretty extreme among the Lagoos. Yes, exactly. Considering how racist Benyon is, they're obviously going to side with Dayan if it comes to a Bjork versus Lagoos war. And that's something that we really don't want. Because... And as long as it does, we cannot allow any war that could stand to engulf all our nations. And also, as long as it does, we must not move. Do not move under any circumstances. I beg of you, do not move. I don't like moving. Welcome back to Fire Emblem Path of Radiance. Last time, we completed our first task for the Apostle Sanaki and found out that, meanwhile, there was a meeting of the Lagoos Kings and they're deciding what to do about the whole Dayan situation. 
Nasala didn't seem trustworthy, as always, and Tivan is pretty bloodthirsty and wants to kill all humans, so let's hope we don't run into him anytime soon. This time, we're going to the Feral Frontier. This chapter is interesting for a few reasons. Firstly, it has another very unique bonus experience condition, and secondly, it has the biggest guide dang it in Fire Emblem history. Firstly though, this music. This is a really nice song, and it's called The White Heron, by the way. And if you've played Radiant Dawn, this song might sound kind of familiar to you. It's not actually in that game, but I feel like its style is just, it's a very Radiant Dawn song. I wouldn't be surprised if the entire Radiant Dawn OST was based off this one track. I'm just being silent a bit just to hear this song play out. Because the song is about to stop and be replaced by Nassau's very ominous theme. So yeah, we got a little bit of backstory there. It seems Raisin's father is still alive, but he's one of the few Heron royals to, well, Herons in general, to still be alive. Yeah, he obviously noticed something was up. Yet more exposition here, Nasala was Raisin's old friend. Some friend he is. I always feel like if this was some kind of Disney movie, Nasala would get some kind of big song about, I'm the kind of guy that you can trust. <laughs> Don't really know whose side I should be on here. On the one hand, I'm not really sure I want a friendship between uh, this guy and Raisin to be developing, and on the other hand, I don't like Raisin's attitude of killing all humans. Like, I'd normally say that dealing with humans is a good thing, but not like this. Although this line is interesting. You might want to remember that line. It won't get pay off for a very long time, but remember this line. Oh no, that guy's here. We already had some info in the last chapter on how desired Serenade's nobles are, so Raisin should be very careful who he shows his face to. I still hear Richard F. Carr's voice for him while he's saying this. So Nasala's dealing with this guy too. 
Dayan, Benyon. He's playing pretty much all sides and backstabbing them all at the same time. Oh, also, by the way, Duke Gados is Lekane. This game doesn't really make it all that clear. Apparently it was clear in the Japanese version, but yes, Duke Gados is Lekane. That will not be relevant in Path of Radiance, though. Oh no. Yeah, I remember when I first played this game and I got to that line and I was like, Oh no, I know exactly where this is going and I don't like it. Meanwhile, back with Ike's group. Seems like we've got a second job. At least Titania noticed that. Yeah, remember that conversation you had back on the boat about there being good and bad people of all kinds? Just as there are good and bad Bjork and Lagoos, there are also both good and bad nobles. And that's all we'll get. We don't really have any info on what our next job is yet, but we did get paid 10,000 gold for the last one, which is why I made a forge weapon there. This is a point in the game where you'll be getting quite a lot of money, and from now until, well, pretty much the end of the game, we're going to be getting tons of gold almost every chapter. Jill got MVP, even though I didn't really um, use her as much as I should have. Yeah, yeah, no casualties. I'm going to be seeing that quote for the rest of the entire game, hopefully. So, what to do? You know what I think I'm going to do first is, I'm going to actually prepare my experience, because... Actually, Nephany's probably going to get attacked three times in the next chapter and level up, so I'm not going to use that on her. Now, I don't want to level up too many people here, because we're about to get a huge chunk of bonus experience. So, next chapter, I'll likely be promoting nearly everyone, and I just remembered, Jill does not have the Wyvern Band equipped. Let's do that, otherwise... I'm not getting the biggest benefit out of my bonus experience here. I'm going to be bonus experiencing Jill a little bit. Now, what I actually said in the last chapter was wrong. You don't need Jill to be promoted to pull off what I'm about to pull off. Wow. Okay, then. That was not good. But yeah, you don't need Jill to be promoted. Even if Jill is completely untrained, she's fine for this job. It's basically her massive weight that we need. Huh. Yeah, those aren't great level ups on Jill so far. Most of my people are just having pretty bad strength overall. Except for Titania, and I guess kind of Ike. That's all for now. The next thing that I need to do is I need to make sure that certain people have as many vulneraries as possible. Soren can probably get by with just one. Volk needs a few. He's gonna need at least two of them. And I don't actually have that many. But who am I kidding? I have money to spare. Speaking of money to spare, in fact, I'll actually talk about that later. Uh, you're fine. Let me just uh, trade that extra vulnerability to. Uh, Nephany may need that. Ike has both an elixir and a vulnerability. He should be fine. How's Jill going, I believe? Okay, she's got two uses of that left. That should be enough. I'm going to go back and equip a Lagoose Guard, though, because she'll need it in the next chapter. Though the Lagoose Guard in general really helps here, you might want to give that to someone like... Actually, it on Volk is not a bad idea. Okay, convoy that. And now that she's hit a D rank, Nephany can finally use this. And with that, she can use a Killer Lance, which I actually don't really need on her. Her offense is pretty much fine as it is with that Forge Lance. It's probably more critical on Gaytree. 
So, remember I said we have money to spare? Well, here's one thing. At this point, sell the torch staff and any torches that you have. Because chapter 14 is the last Fog of War chapter in the game. Yep, Fog of War only exists on hard mode, and even then it only exists for two chapters. So, torches and the torch staff, completely worthless from this point on. So might as well get a little bit of money back for the torch staff. Not a lot, but still a little bit. No reason to keep them at all, just sell them. Also, I'm an idiot, I could have just traded one of my fresh vulnerabilities over to, um... Volk, I did not need to buy a new one, but that's fine. You know, you might as well take one from someone I'm not using. Yeah, I guess I should probably just convoy the entire inventory of everyone that I'm not using at this point. Okay, now you take that restore staff that I got. I also got an interesting skill scroll, which I might want to... Yeah, see, here's the question. I can't actually teach this to Nephany yet until she promotes, because she doesn't have enough capacity for it, unless I remove Miracle, which, let's be honest, Miracle's not really going to do much. But, I'm a bit conflicted on who to give Vantage to. On the one hand, Vantage Wrath is really fun. On the other hand, I found another combo that's actually really fun as well, and that's Vantage Guard on Jill. What does Guard do? We're going to find out soon. We'll be getting the Guard Scroll in this chapter. So I have to think, um, what I do there. For the moment, I think we're fine here, but there is one thing that I need to do now. Absolutely, positively now. And that is to make a forged fire tome. I actually really, really need this for the strategy that I'm going to pull off in this chapter. So the strategy that I'll be using, I actually don't need any crit on this at all, really. All I need is just to raise its might up to eight. Don't really need to bother with the hit rate. Hit rate is fine, and it'll be too expensive to raise the crit rate. Yeah, that's all right. I just need a fire tone with a lot of might. And Elfire is not enough because at this point, Sauron doesn't double with it against the boss, and he wouldn't one round if he did double, so yeah. A maxed out forged fire tome with Sauron at this point will be guaranteed to one round the boss. So I need that for the strategy that I'm planning. So, this tome, I was wondering what I call this, but I thought of something. That's a bit of an in-joke for me, but anyway. I probably should have saved this until Radiant Dawn, but um don't even know if I can fit this actually. Maybe I have to do no spaces. I really hope this fits. Yeah, that's just enough with no spaces. So, um, this is a reference to a very bizarre mistranslation in Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn, uh, where the character, where the glossary, in the American version only, so not in the version I play, but the glossary calls the Fire Emblem the Heart of Fire. How they managed to mistranslate the name of the namesake of the series, I have no idea, but they did. So, I always found that funny. I was going to save that story until Radiant Dawn, but, um good opportunity to bring it up here. Basically, if I ever make an RPG or something, I'm going to call something in the game Heart of Fire, because I just want to do that, because it's funny. Anyway, uh, oh, I thought that I can sign whatever B not by now. That's actually not good. However, there is a support that I've been waiting for a very, very long time to do here, Leth and Jill. This is pretty much the main reason why I've kept Leth in the army for this long. I really want to do these supports. These supports are absolutely amazing. It's a bit of an insight into how the prejudice runs pretty deep on both sides without any real reason. But 
It's the B support and the A support, but the B support's one of the most interesting because it goes into some pretty cool backstory and also has great development for Jill. So, the info conversation in this chapter, you might notice we have two two-star ones, so a lot of hints for this next one, but I want to do Makalov's first because this one's pretty funny. Yes, we rescue you from those debt collectors and now you're living in a luxurious palace. Clearly there is no justice in this world. Speaking of no justice in this world, guess who Makalov is a love interest for? If you said Astrid, you're correct. It really says something that people would prefer Astrid to get together with Gaytree than with Makalov. <laughs> Makalov, Ike is standing right behind you. And of course, the moment that you get income, you're like, oh yeah, let's use it for more gambling. That's not going to backfire at all. <laughs> oh, that's also a very good line. Like, if there was like a, I don't know, if someone ever made a poll for like, which character across the entire series has some of the best dialogue, I think I could be pretty far up there. I mean, he's in debt to pretty much everyone he meets. I feel like the number of people on this continent that Makalov owes money is probably bigger than the number who he doesn't owe money to. Well, that's pretty generous. Except that wasn't really a kindness. You'll see. Yep, that all came out of his wages. Makalov is working for free for probably the next 50 years. <laughs> Makalov is kind of a controversial character in the fanbase. Like, TV Trope says it best. It says you either love him for his pink hair, orange armor, and jerkassery, or you hate him for the exact same reasons. But I'm actually mostly okay with Makalov only because he's intentionally unlikable. You're not meant to like him, and you're meant to laugh at his expense all the time. Oh, well, at least this seems to be one of the nicer people in Benyon. Or not really. <laughs> oh, Joy, we have a desert chapter next. That's the first mention of that, which is interesting. Another pretty big part of the backstory. Don't have a picnic in the desert, it'll probably end badly. Hmm. Okay, bandits, which means by Fire Emblem Logic, we're going to be fighting them. And this line right here, this line. We hear occasional reports of strange figures wandering the dunes in the northeast. This, believe it or not, is your only hint to recruiting a certain character. It's incredibly vague, it doesn't give you any indication of how you do it. This is your only hint, and like, if you... Say you're on a first playthrough and you read this, would you think this was a hint of how to recruit someone? Because they're not even on the map at all. There's nothing in the northeast corner of this map. And yet this line is the only indication that there's someone who even exists that you can recruit in this chapter. It's really, really stupid. This conversation is a bit more information about the desert. But I'll be explaining how much of a guide dang it this is once we actually get there. 
because seriously, when I first played this game, I had no idea this character even existed. Not really. It is also extremely hot and dry, very little water, you are likely to die of dehydration, mounted units uh, have terrible movement there. So yeah, she's explaining how the desert will severely impede most people's movement. Yeah, that means very little defensive terrain here. So, this is pretty typical for the series. Anyone who uses magic is not slowed down by the sand. Although, remember that, I think I've said this in another playthrough, but if you're mounted and also a magic user, which is really only missed at this point in the game if you've promoted her by now, being mounted supersedes being a magic user, so you get slowed down severely. So here's one of these times where not having this promoted is a good thing. And yeah, thieves uh, can get through the desert quickly, which is good, because they're also vital for finding treasure in the desert. This line is actually interesting, because the series has given multiple explanations for why natives aren't slowed down by the sand. In FE12, they just say it's because they wear light clothing. But here, they have a much more dramatic explanation. Except it's ambiguous whether or not it's true. Yeah, Prime Minister Seferin takes after Sanaki, and they both like to troll people. So flying obviously means you're not slowed down by the sand. So flyers, very valuable here, because they can carry people over it. You may want to remember this, Lagoos get slowed down slightly by the desert, but not all that much. Well, at least Sigun is um, a pretty decent person. For such a holy city, I'm surprised that you're one of the few people who thinks like that here. Well, yes, Ike, you've already been proven wrong about all nobles being jerks. <laughs> we heard about that in the last conversation, but... This is a more direct hint. There are going to be treasures in the sand. It's good that thieves can move through the sand freely, because thieves have a 100% chance of picking up treasure. Are there any other supports I can do? No, I think I'm fine on supports. So, let's move out. This is going to be a very unique chapter, as I've hinted at a few times. Here we are in the desert. Something seems off about Soren, though. He was actually acting weirdly on the boat, too. And this is probably the bandits they were talking about. This is why Sanaki probably should have filled you in on uh, the mission. Yep, we've got a ton of Lagoos here. In the middle of the Grand Desert. And here's our boss.
Now before I cut to the next part, I want to explain how I'll be handling this chapter. This chapter, like chapter 10, has one very unique bonus experience condition. As you might have gathered from the intro conversation there, these Lagoos aren't really the bad guys here. Because of that, you get bonus experience for every one of them who you don't kill. You also get another load of bonus experience if you complete this chapter as a complete pacifist run. That is, do not kill any enemy on the map apart from the boss, who's right here. Now the boss is a tiger so is weak to fire magic. This is why I made Sorin a forge fire tone. How you approach this chapter depends wildly on who you've trained. So I can't really give you a pacifist strategy that's guaranteed to work for everyone. But I will say that a promoted Sorin or Ileana with a forge fire tome can pretty comfortably one round the boss. So as long as you rush them to him and take him down quickly, you're set. Here's the problem though. We also have to worry about finding the treasures in the deserts. There are a lot of treasures in this chapter, and there are some very, very useful ones, like a guard skill scroll, boots, and a physics staff. We want to pick up as many of the treasures as possible, which means babysitting a few thieves and making sure they don't die to some of these powerful enemies. And then we also have... the biggest guy dang in the history of Fire Emblem. See the square that I'm pointing to with my cursor right now? Leth or Mordecai needs to stand on this one square. It is the only way to recruit a certain character. I'm just going to pause for a bit and let that sink in. If I hadn't said that, would you have had any idea to try that? Would you have had any idea what the heck to do in this situation? The only hint at this is that mention of strange figures wandering the dunes to the northeast. That's the only hint, and it says nothing about Leth or Mordecai. But it has to be one of them. If anyone else steps in this space, you get a very powerful sword, but you won't recruit that character. And recruiting this character, they come with that sword, so really no reason not to recruit them. They also get you something special in the next chapter too. So yeah, how I'm going to go about this is, I'm going to have Jill, who is the only one with enough weight to carry Mordecai, even if she's unpromoted. I'm going to have Jill pick up Mordecai and ferry him all the way up here. In the meantime, Soth and Volk will be running around the desert trying to dodge the Lagoos and grab the treasure. All while that's happening, Sora will be slipping through here and getting into a position where he can hit the boss with a fireball and end the chapter. The moment that we recruited this character and have all the treasure. So that's the plan, I will see you next time when we execute it.